Uh, to continue now our discussion, I would uh, like to introduce uh, maybe again. Um, or you introduce yourself, I would say. Uh, we go around. Uh, you've heard already Martin, except Martin Buchholz. So, Martin Buchholz, uh, we worked quite a lot of time together, and this water key concept of one prototype we constructed in London is quite near to uh, what we discuss at the zero emission concept, so to circle everything in one building, uh, not just uh, energy and water, so we can recycle water by the recondensation process of uh, evaporated water by plants in a greenhouse in front, we have established a salt solution system, but this we can explain. Maybe as a first uh, question for you, uh, what's your dream of the uh, buildings of the future, Martin? Okay. Of course, this uh, relates a lot uh, to what Marco already uh, well, has been mentioning. Um, for me, uh, the zero emission building is uh, covered with a transparent roof. So uh, a greenhouse is a part of it, uh, not only as a source of food or as a form of urban horticulture or so, but also as a source of uh, thermal energy in a way that we use the solar energy in the building and to transfer this energy into the building either directly by drying the air or indirectly by just storing heat and then uh, uh, when we need the heat uh, bringing it to the building uh, but it's more than this it's, uh, it's related to the idea of, of closed roof that means uh, in the presentation of Mr. Bauman we saw that uh, the, the, the grey water, um, the, the most expensive thing about grey water uh, cleaning is to remove the phosphorus and the nitrogen, but these are the, the plant minerals we need, so uh, it makes most sense uh, to give it to the, to the crops directly. And um, well, um, this is a part of the vision. Uh, another part of the vision is that we don't. We will, of course, not only look at the building, but also at the interaction, so what makes sense to do within the building and what makes sense to interact with the neighborhood or with the community. And for that, um, I think, uh, just to tell some maybe things we have not heard today, we think about kind of desk-camp network as, a, as an additional transfer of energy. That means you can use all kind of waste heat in the city uh, for the regeneration of desiccant, and we can use all kind of humid air uh, to take up the humidity into a desiccant and uh, can generate heat by that, or can generate cool by that, just by drying air. Drying of air is also a big portion of, of cooling, of cooling uh, strategies. Maybe uh, to relate to the last um, um, lecture of Mr. Figlo, I would also like to uh, uh, enhance the idea of terra preta. I think the waste, solid waste, maybe all the biological material we don't use, should be converted to, to, um, to durable uh, material. I, I think it's not a good idea to burn it, maybe even not to, do, uh, to transfer it to, to biogas. Maybe we can discuss this. <laughs> but, um, uh, uh, but this is already a very high form of carbon and we should not degrade it, but we should use it as a storage, a storage of water and a storage of, of nutrients and that's maybe uh, uh, the key to a new uh, level of uh, sustainability, which is not a closed loop society, but a growing uh, idea of a growth uh, to, to increase the capacity uh, of a city, like wings of a, of a, uh, of a tree which grow and into the surface of, let's say, um, um, a land with, with bad soils transferred uh, into a land of good soils, which are around the city. Maybe that's for the first <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. I think I will give uh, the round just uh, one word and then we open it for the public for uh, discussions. Um, if we are now looking into the landscapes, um, 
Martin Künzlen, so what is your opinion after 30 years of working in ecological construction? If we are now looking at uh, uh, the existing construction, then architects we educate here at the university are always trying if they escape from university to create uh, at least uh, 800 meter tower building um, as high as uh, more glass as possible at the moment, uh, neglecting all the questions of resources and neglecting how you might go into the uh, floor number 130 when having no electricity maybe in 30 years. So um, you started already 30 years ago. Um, the resources uh, we are losing at the moment are 800 square kilometers every day in vegetation. We are losing 300 square kilometers every day in fertile soils. Of course, Terra Preta we should establish. You had this vision already 30 years ago. Maybe uh, some old cultures already uh, a few hundred or a thousand years ago after they uh, established that the uh, resource efficiency was not efficient enough to survive, like you can see in a lot of uh, um, former uh, cities which you can find in the desert now. So what's your opinion? What uh, went wrong in the past 30 years? And how should we now react to uh, create a new development? Well, I think it's not having no ideas, you know, having no strategies. Well, um, getting into
Yeah, Martin, thank you very much. Yeah. I, um, if you compare it now to the energy aspect, it was like a revolution we did here in Germany. Uh, we should, uh, we will need that for the water supply and as well for the building material. Of course, the companies they have the main interest to sell their products, so to sell water and to avoid having people producing their own water quality. Uh, this happens the same in the energy sector. So. Um, my idea was we would need a so-called German Einspeisegesetz for water that if you producing tap water, so drinking water quality out of your shit, you get more money, money if you feed the grid than if you would pay if you just uh, get it out of the grid. I know this is a really fundamental uh, question, but um, we have to fight, especially in the water and in the uh, building material sector, uh, a huge fight, so it took us in the energy sector at least 20 to 25 years. I would like now to ask the young, young generation, I could ask as well Catalina, there upstairs, <laughs> thanks for your support. Uh, I would like to ask you, um, so what is now your impression? So you gave us yesterday um, quite a good idea of ecological construction and you evaluated uh, some aspects. Um, why are you different from the other students we are normally educating and which are leaving our university? So what do you think? What is your opinion about ecological construction? So why you are not intending to construct a 404 high-rise building and an ecological building instead? Um, I would say that first you maybe have to look at what is actually the overall aim. So is it just to have a ecological building that corresponds to all the things that we heard these two days? Or what is what is the actual goal? So I always say I actually we just want to be happy. We don't want to live in a just in a stable home. We want to be happy. So what do we need for that? Um, is it everything that we think we have to have, or is it all about resources, what we need for a living, and do we have to supply these on an ecological way? So can we just reduce it and still be happy and have everything we need? So um, I always try to step back and see what do we want actually, and not just follow also the conventional ecological approach like we see here, but maybe even go further back and see what happens we want. Maybe I can tell a little story because I was in Fiji and I went on a little island and there was no grid and the people they just had a generator that run maybe two hours in the evening and me as an environmental engineer, and what we call the generator, diesel, zero emissions. This is so bad. They have the wind, they have sun, and oh yeah, we should we should set up solar panels. We should make wind turbines. And we were a little group, and we started to think further. And then so, so what would happen? So the whole island would have a grid, and people could use their computers all day long. Go on the internet, they could see what there is, the new new branches would open, they would have banks and they go to work by public transport and so on and so on. And in the end they would probably end up in a society like us. They would be working all day, they they hate their lives, they, they never see their family, they don't see their siesta. And then you would look back and say, So so what's wrong actually? Like, why would you do that? They're happy now, they live in their homes, they're not poor, they get the fruit out of the wood, they see their children around, they sing songs at night, they're so nice, they're so happy. So just leave this stupid generation. <laughs> 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 it doesn't compare in any way. I would like to come in here, if I may, because we're talking about the discussion now, you're just asking and everybody answering. So, uh, I would like to catch up the story, yeah. the story from Nepal. In the mountains of Nepal, 
also went to a very remote area and uh, they had no generator because you really have to walk very far so it would be very much effort to carry the diesel for the generator there but they had because to make the life better and happy and to give the people a chance for doing handicraft and getting somewhat income and uh, learning for the school and languages they got, uh, with subsidy from the government, a very small A4 solar panel with a small battery to connect just two bulbs to it. So, very small renewable thing, but not changing the life completely, but making the people there. So, something which is a uh, yeah, contribution to sustainable energy supply, supporting the people who are So, <laughs> so many could also do it, maybe not so great, but yeah. Yeah, great. I really enjoy you sitting here because you are old generation and really young generation <laughs> and we nearly old generation where we say something in between um, and uh, all working against mainstream and uh, this is really um, fascinating for me. Uh, we just have now to find a solution how to convince all the others outside of this room and there are lots of architects and engineers and companies who are um, completely going into the other direction, now how to convince them. There's one um, good example how we can convince them. So people are still, they are not lost. So uh, that's why we are sitting here and working to convince them. And one aspect is of course certification because um, most of them they don't know what to do. So we need to have guidelines and we have a certification uh, aspect in um, which we can define here, which we can influence. I think some aspects from my perspective are still completely wrong in the opposite aspect indeed, but that's the uh, type of nature I need to uh, influence, I think, the process. That's why we are here. And um, what is at the moment um, your opinion, uh, Annika, what uh, should be the direction in the near future? Um, what is the perspective should we make it? for example, for free, like we did in the energy aspect, that you get the guidance for certification for free in the near future. Uh, what is at the moment the handicap? Why uh, just a few architects and engineers and developers are accepting uh, seats and into GNB, uh, a certification system? Or um, is there, are there any other, other circumstances uh, um, which we need to change? Um, interesting question. Okay. <laughs> well, we do have free guidelines for sustainable It's actually because uh, the federal ministry uh, uh, of the government, I think right, <laughs> um, is uh, published on a different area and a uh, big guideline on the internet. So on www.nachhaltigenstand.de, uh, everybody can download it. And, um, but um, doesn't mean the architects do it, right? So why they don't do it? Because uh, most of the measures, um, well, they, uh, how can I say this? Um, of course, we have more effort to do this, to make uh, buildings sustainable uh, through this and that. The question is, is it sustain, uh, building sustainable because we uh, make it uh, where uh, this uh, standard? That's an interesting question. But um, the system is developed um, to more practical uh, methods because there's uh, some um, aims in there that uh, nobody uh, out there in such a type can ever meet uh, requirements that are not meetable. Um, and they're getting better and better, and uh, more people are actually out on the construction site uh, come into these uh, groups that develop the system more and more. So it becomes uh, better to handle and it becomes more stricter. Um, and for that reason, um, it's developed in a good way, I think. 
um, we have very academic beginning. So, um, and I mean, that is a good thing to carry the idea of the sustainable building out into, uh, can reach a much more people. So, I think it's a good beginning. Yes, I would like to start with a statement regarding the sustainable building. It's because they are not mandatory, but they are, you know, you ask the question why are more people using it. Because they are only used by people who want to use it as a marketing instrument. Finally, it's all about money, I think. Money and habits. So and if people and desires. So if people want something, they also pay a lot of money for it, even though it's not logical, right? So why do people buy a Porsche or a big car to go from A to B? You can also do it with a... Jochen, what's the name of your car? Nasia. It does. <coughs> so very simple, very cheap. You can get it for how many euros? 4,900. Okay. And some people pay half a million euro for a car. No? So then you ask yourself, spend so much money for expensive cars, why not for ecological houses? Because there is no desire, <laughs> obviously. And, uh, but there could be some progress if you look, for example, at the organic, uh, organic uh, food market in Germany. It's a really boom over the last few years. And uh, you ask the people if they could afford it, like I think 90% of the Germans would buy organic. So there is some hope regarding sustainability. But coming back to the certification tool, you have these different rating systems, you have to pay money for it. So if everybody would have this certification, there would be no incentive anymore to have the certification because we have outstanding. So that means the principle of these certification tools is that only a few buildings are certified. If it would be mandatory by law to have the sustainable building, then people have to do it. Like uh, the NF, you know, the not in energy efficiency, the, the rating system. If it's mandatory, people have to follow it. Maybe they just try to play some tricks, to not invest so much to get the label, but uh, then you really can introduce uh, in a development. And if, uh, if I may recall, it's if I may recall the presentation uh, of, uh, of you, it's uh, the, the biggest problem, at least in Europe, is uh, that, uh, uh, Europe, that we have um, so much existing building stock. So even if we have very high requirements for the new buildings, and even if like EJ and Platinum would be uh, mandatory, we have a building renewal rate in Europe of less than 1% per year, so it would take like more than 100 years to replace all the buildings, theoretically, you know, practically even longer. So uh, that means that these uh, government requirements have to target also the existing building stock, or that there are financial incentives. So I think these are the main drivers, like desire that really people want something, <laughs> so, um, what I have to say, I'm really glad that uh, the sustainable building standard of DNB is not mandatory because, um, like I said, we are still in the very beginning and there are now some investors out there who have the money to try out these things and to uh, give the experience to the rest of the world. So, this is what's happening right now. And I think this uh, market is developing so fast that in 10 years from now, like 80% of the criteria that we were talking about uh, today will be standard in 10 years. So um, thank God it's not mandatory today, but it will be maybe in 10 years when it's uh, growing out of its kinder shoes. So I think it's a good thing. Yes, thank you very much. I think these are really good conclusions. <coughs>
I, I have the same feeling because uh, we tried with the water G concept as well uh, uh, to sell uh, uh, zero emission buildings, which is uh, um, not, not easy to get into the market once and it's not easy to uh, get it running. So it's uh, quite uh, complicated uh, because we have always a conflict in uh, different aspects and goals yeah, for energy, water, food production and so on in buildings. So we need to find solution. I don't want to add uh, too much because I want to open now um, uh, the discussions. Maybe we uh, can collect three, four, five questions and then we go into the next round for to participate everyone. Is it okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Jochen, so. Yeah. You, uh, Marco, yeah. you said that you have the same idea that, uh, that in future we will, we will we are we are on the right way. So, and I tell you something. We started uh, the work with the grey water recycling and the rainwater housing 1984. So, we construct some of these treatments and we know they are working and they are working well and then they are working economically. So. And now please tell me, where are the other plants? Where are the plants for rainwater housing in schools in Berlin? Because there was a program, we made three schools maybe, or I have how many? Three, four, maybe? We have more rainwater systems? Nothing. Why? Tell me. Thank you. 
maybe we just close it and, and then we we'll make around here. here. So yeah, it's and I have to close it or not? What? And I give you an answer. Okay. Yes, I, I even haven't finished. <laughs> yeah, just we were just wondering if it's working. Because the point is that if you have decentralized water system, it's a kind of inverse infrastructure, right? We have a centralized water system, so you have been set up centralized. We have interventions on decentralizing which the consumption. So because the, we pay the systems by quantity, we reduce the quantity, which if it's public or private, it doesn't matter, but the costs have to be covered because the infrastructure is for users. So we have to cover the infrastructure costs. So if we have a second infrastructure coming up, then at some point, if it's getting too powerful, it's a kind of concurrence to the existing system because you have the finance for systems. So that means if the centralized system is getting more, more expensive because people use less and less water, you are at some point you say we just don't need the centralized system anymore because we cannot afford the two systems. This argument here it can't last because if you look at our co co at our society. The problem we have is all over the world. If you big society, uh, big uh, societies, or you have big companies now, and the market is changing, you know, they don't sell anymore enough. What they do, you know, they get little and they get rid of uh, personal, and they develop strategies. And I think uh, also uh, for water. And for electricity, it needs strategies for the big companies. You know, we can't say, well, um, their uh, system, you know, it has to be, um, or there's still money they need. You know, if we do this, you know, you, you never change things. Yeah, no, maybe you don't, market, maybe market you don't understand me. It's, it's more like imagine you have one car. You have to pay one car. If you have a second car, and even though you drive not the other one, you have to pay both, right? It's not about, it's not, an, of course, there may be companies who make right. profit. It's just about the logic of the system that if you have an infrastructure for system, you have to maintain it. Yeah, but that's only for a while. Yeah. You have to get two cars, you have it for a while. And yeah, if after a while, you have just that one. It yeah, that's, that's okay, the but then, then, if you have, then you have a bond in one system, you know? Then you have to say, okay, we go yeah. for the decentralized system and we don't have the centralized system. Okay, I want to follow the discussion with four or five and then we make a round. Martin as well wanted to uh, answer and then we go back to you. So if Thorsten dis <laughs> disturbed, then you will throw it off. Okay. Maybe just a personal statement. Uh, for me, this is uh, a bit too much politics to a bear. Uh, I think uh, I have, for me, I have find a personal position for that, and that's about, and in, in, in the end, it's about aesthetics. Mm. I, uh, you were saying, Marco, here is a round of people uh, of different minds, but they are all against the mainstream, and uh, I wonder sometimes uh, all the music in the radio, uh, all this mainstream, which I cannot bear. Um, how could something like the Beatles happen? <laughs> and I think it was about that people don't like, uh, they like changes, but only if the result is 100% the same, then we know. Huh? But only if we have some uh, examples or some uh, idols, I would say, who are some happy, and which I like to follow. Uh, then I can change my mind and can go with them. And I think uh, it's, I think in the end it's the only way to go for a certain way uh, uh, and to live it. And by this can show uh, something to other people and if it's attractive enough, people will follow. And uh, maybe this is a bit romantic and so, but uh, uh, I, I don't believe in the power of me as a consumer. When I drive a bicycle instead of a car, bicycle, I like it, but I'm not demonstrating for uh, 
platinum cycling, but um, it's more kind of personal aesthetics for me. Yeah? Uh, I, I, I dislike uh, big, uh, or let's say, uh, consume, uh, to consume uh, uh, or materialism. Uh, I prefer to have it in a small way. And, and this, but this is more an aesthetic statement than a moralistic or a political statement, I think. Uh, maybe it's very roughly what I wanted to say. So what you're saying is if a pretty man like you is driving a bicycle, this might invite imitation. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it must be the attractivity of solution. Okay, then we open because uh, you have been the first one and then uh, we open the next round for discussion. <coughs> Thank you. 
Uh, so adapting this to the existing structure is quite, it's quite hard, and when I was up at company, it's, it's not, not so easy to change this. So that, then there have to be other pressures. Let's say if it's uh, the uh, water is it's also too cheap, it should be more expensive. And the other people would complain it's too expensive. Uh, perhaps uh, many people have to disconnect and the water is too expensive, then yes, uh, pressure will be a change. Okay, I lost a little bit of the track. Who was the next script? Yeah, and I'm over there. Heiko, as well, you have some comments? Actually, I don't think that it's so difficult to change. I mean, if you look around what happened in Berlin the last, I don't know, 25 years since the fall of the wall, I mean, a lot of things changed within, I don't know, a couple of years. And if you look, um, for example, at this urban farming movement, I mean, there's no, it just happened. They created people, in fact, who did the change. And it's, it was not the government, it was not a bottom-up, a, do a top-down um, change, it was a bottom-up change. And it kind of links up what Martin said. I think what is important is to take these people for serious and don't put any put more obstacles in, in their way, way because they, they pick up the themes which are important right now in the 21st century. And they link it with happiness, with quality of life, other issues. And for me, it's interesting to watch what happens now, especially in Berlin. Um, for example, the Temple Hoop. I mean, they made a lot of studies financed by the Senate, and they they sell Berlin in a way, being a happy city, a creative city. But on the other hand, they, they, right now, I mean, we don't hear it a lot. But on the other hand, now they discuss to build up the whole area. I mean, or at least the the edges to make new housing um, space um, around a Temple Hoop. And what what do they do? They um, bulldoze all these urban farmers, which which are there for more than 100 years. I mean, they don't. That is it. So I think we should look at the old, um, how to say, it, old structures we have, or old uh, social um, culture we have in the city, and and the new, and how we can link up to this, and how, yeah, to, to really um, give them power. Or, or yeah, give them space to talk, to communicate, and yeah, take them for serious. Okay, and then, yeah. uh, only a, a little comment from me. I, I think it's very important that we have also our own experience. Uh, um, a special example I use since five years, uh, dry separation toilet. And if I must put my urine in drink water, I know it. And I don't want to do it. And so if, you have the, if more people have the experience that it's possible, really simple to change systems, you are more motivated to do it. And uh, it's also, if you ask why we have our, uh, under this conditions, mission projects in Germany. We have zero emission uh, cities and uh, zero emission communities. Then this is uh, also a question of economy because the people are have not enough money, they think about how can they change the conditions. And it's so simple to earn also money if you think more in system structures and see what you waste and how often you must pay for your food and so on. But I think we must start also in the universities, in the schools, as the people have experience with well-designed systems. <coughs> True, we need to convince the people. I'm still um, taking my shower even in the winter time outside in the garden because I know evapotranspiration is missing, so I need to put every drop of water back into the atmosphere. But it will be hard to convince people for that. <laughs>
think that's a good and optimistic way. So this means it was enough done already that this comes to maybe an idea. It does, maybe they will not win, but uh, there is a high tendency to do that. So I think we just have to keep on doing that and not to lose hope. Thank you. I would like you to come back now. Comment. Just, just a final, yeah? We make now a final, final round. Because Maybe it starting. Because the city of uh, Rotterdam, they even moved to, because they, it's public, yeah? the infrastructure has been there for years, and they have mixed sewer system, and due to change of rainfall, they have a same problem. So it's not that they have mixed sewer system, and due to change of rainfall, they have the same concept, and they have a big, since years, a big green roof program, so they even pay incentives to house owners to install green roofs. So save money on remodeling of the centralized infrastructure. Okay. Final round. <laughs> well, I think um, the overall problem that we're talking about is not about a um, technical or scientific problem. It's actually just a political um, framework that that lacks all these policies that support technologies like that. And once we have a framework that puts the right incentives to invest in such technologies, the whole process will keep running by itself. And even not ecologic people will start to invest in that because they can see that there are benefits from it. And I often have this discussion with people and they say, even from my study, they say, oh, people are too lazy. They, they don't want to do that. It's much of an effort, yeah, you can't change mankind, it's just the way it is. And then I always say, well, I, I think you can, I think people are not stupid to, that you can change them. You just have to set the right framework and put incentives and then they automatically will change the way of behavior and they won't even notice. So, yeah. <laughs> So if, if you have the option, you want to build a building and you see that the ecological building is much cheaper than the conventional building, it's stupid not to go for that. And they will go for, for the ecological building and at the same time they are convinced of it because they decide for it and nobody told them to do that. So I think to put incentives that it's the right way to go and not to tell people what to do or not to do because I think that makes them mad and then they will start to fight against all these things. But whenever they get the feeling that they made the choice, they will support it. Well, <coughs> I had two experiences. The one side is very good, the other side is very good. And what I told before, you know, the fight with bureaucracies, and that's the best best um, side. And the good side is um, cooperation with people, with owners, with inhabitants, with tenants. And um, because of this experience, you know, I think I want to go on to be an ecological architect and there is no doubt about it. And, uh, but I still see uh, the ecological architects are minority and all the others around us are non-ecological architects, but especially also in the architect organization, architect we come up with this one. And you know, when we once you know, were discussing in the architect and you know, in the official place, you know, we were called Muslim architects. <laughs> and I don't know the uh, expression in, in English. Serial architect. Okay. Yeah. That's what I am. <laughs> so, and I will stay with it, and uh, so I accept this, but I can't change society. And I know I can't do that, and you can do it you know, in a very close, uh, extra society, 
and it's fun, and I do it. Uh, um, with energy, but um, there's also the bad side. Thank you. Yes, luckily we can have individual freedom. Everybody can do whatever he wants, huh? uh, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> you maybe. <laughs> no, but I mean, uh, coming back maybe to the, to the zero emission approach. Huh? Our goal in the project is to create a framework for zero emission buildings. So to make ha people happy that they accept the sustainable technology and the sustainable buildings we think about. Very important, everybody wants to be happy. Um, then we saw on the slide of Holger Kulig, who is not here anymore, I think, but he had this nice calculation that uh, you can, if you plan the building in a proper way, then you can save during the lifetime of the building the additional cost. If you calculate an energy rise of plus 4%, but you didn't calculate the interest of the money if you go to the bank and you need your money to do the investment. If he, I expect if he would have calculated the, the interest, the payback period would be much longer because you have to pay interest every year of certain currently it's not so much, but maybe four to five percent. So if you don't have the cash money, you have to pay the interest. That means the ecological building, if we do more, <coughs> we have to pay more, it's more expensive. So that means the point of incentives, I think, is very, very crucial. And in our project application, which everybody of our project partners should have read, we also said that we want to achieve the building without additional cost, because we save also on central infrastructures. Because we say we want to have decentralized infrastructure integrated into the zero emission building approach. We have a colleague from uh, Canada here. She was involved in uh, Doc, Dockside Green, Dockside Green in uh, Victoria. And that's a new urban development, uh, top-down development with uh, quite decentralized infrastructure. And the developers have chosen for the decentralized infrastructure due to economical reasons, right? Because it was cheaper than connecting to the centralized system. Because they save in conventional infrastructure. So I think this is, is very, very crucial and this is somehow uh, following up my statement with the double infrastructures. Driving two cars, then you have to pay both. Uh, so this is, uh, if you ask me, a very crucial point and we can, in our framework, also contribute to the public discussion about the sense and nonsense of centralized infrastructure and how our approach can contribute to uh, strategies, how to partly stepwise rebuild the existing infrastructure systems to more smart and sustainable infrastructures. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, first I'd like to link to your Lifecycle costing payoff argument. Um, the lifecycle costing uh, method is not it doesn't have the power actually to give you a cost forecast because operation costs will strongly depend on like how good the winter is, how good is the behavior of the users inside the building, like uh, always opening the window and have, like. I refer I refer to the presentation of Holger Kuhn. Yeah, did that. I saw it, I saw it. Yeah. But it's that forecast, not the cost forecast, not the real cost for, uh, forecast, because you cannot, you're not able to forecast uh, operation costs. It's not possible. Of course, he did it. And he said also that there's an energy cost rise per year of yeah, cost you can't, 4 you can't really like predict uh, the heating costs. Of, of course, you do nothing else if you do like the energy certification of your building. You do a forecast. You calculate, no, you simulate no, the energy think, consumption. You, you probably you get an idea of like the cost level, and it's something totally.
completely different than a cost forecast. The journal uh, doesn't have to follow the rules, actually. It's just, and if you, if you use the same um, uh, method and uh, simulate the same cells, different buildings, you can compare them, but it's not the forecast. But um, uh, anyway, <laughs> I think um, that the um, success, success of instruments and technologies um, will or is combined to information, to make uh, people, to sense people and um, to give them the, uh, the idea of what is happening to background information and um, like transparency. Transparency is a new way. Uh, to make it successful, and yeah, that's it. Okay. Uh, maybe from my side, uh, a final comment on uh, strategies of change. So there is an old slogan, uh, think global, act local, but I think for an engineer it should be, is a, a very bad slogan. So I think the idea of going to other places uh, is uh, of a big power and uh, now this uh, round here we have people from Korea and from Istanbul for example and there we have other water problems and Marco and me we went in, a, in another project we, we, we drove with a hired car through the area greenhouse area of Agadir in Morocco all these places where uh, water completely disappeared and there uh, almost a million of people uh, lose their foundation of life and of work. And uh, to found, uh, if we really are able to, to make a little proposal there for, for, for another system, uh, that could be very powerful. And could, uh, I think there's a real chance of making changes. And I, I, in general, I think that not everything uh, not every new technology will arrange now from the old industrial country, industrialized countries, but by this uh, force of, let's say, the mega cities or so, they will have to, these places will have to uh, invent their own solutions and maybe they will spread over to us finally and uh, are cheaper and, and more effective than our system. So, well, uh, that's about it. Maybe the final comment on the water um, uh, uh, channel in London. Uh, we have also growing ground weather now in the center of Berlin. Yeah. Maybe it would be very nice to, to have a big program on irrigating every, every roof and every park site in the center now. That would be very cheap compared to the damage now is done by the rising uh, into, of the water into the cellars. Maybe that could be a, a new common project for this group. <laughs> Yeah, okay, yeah. But we increase still the uh, groundwater recharge by infiltration, so we need to convert to evaporation because that's what's missing. That's my, uh, what say, final um, uh, remarks. So let's try and evaporate everything. And this is one of the uh, uh, final recommendations we need to work on on zero emission buildings and on certification because it's still not in mind. There are hundreds of uh, parameters uh, which are still not in mind, but which have already been developed in experience uh, from projects in the past and I think we need to collect them. So there are lots of solutions which have been already developed, lots of experience and sometimes it gets lost. Um, lost with people and being involved in these projects like we lost, for example, Jochen in the past, now he comes back to the rainwater aspect after he experienced um, beer production. No? <laughs> I hope you uh, get some ideas of the whole uh, aspect um, or uh, part of the aspect of zero emission buildings. It's a complicated approach, but uh, I think we will get it. So thank you very much for participating and I hope you enjoyed uh, our Zero Emission Conference. Thanks.